Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Supporting Collaboration Without Compromising Security. Fuel the speed of innovation by becoming a collaborative business. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Audrey Enriquez, and I'm the Programs Manager at CMS Wire. We're just going to take care of a few housekeeping items here before we get started. Just want to let you know that you can submit your questions at any point during the webinar to the WebEx. QA module in your bottom right-hand corner of your platform. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at hashtag SmarterSocialBiz, hashtag CEM, hashtag Tempo, or hashtag OpenTech. Um, we have someone monitoring all those channels today, so we can also answer questions there. Today's agenda, we'll spend about five minutes or so on introductions. We'll spend about 40 minutes with our speakers, Rob Koplowitz and Marcy Maddox and they'll be discussing driving value while protecting critical assets, implementing a holistic techn technology approach, and establishing a social strategy game plan that'll ensure rapid and effective adoption. Then we'll spend the last 15 minutes on live Q&A. Um, if you want to sub submit questions at any point during the webinar, we'll try to have Rob and Marcy answer those in the real time as well. Just a little bit about Siemens Wire. We were founded in 2003, and we have over 100 monthly contributors. We publish over 300 articles a month. We have editorial themes surrounding customer experience, digital marketing, social business and enterprise collaboration, enterprise information management, SharePoint, Office 365, and the ecosystem. Today's speaker, Rob Kopowitz is VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester. He serves CIO pros with research in the areas of information workplace and collaboration strategy. He delivers strategic guidance, helping enterprises define enterprise solutions that drive efficiency and competitive differentiation. His current research focuses on core elements of collaboration strategy, including collaboration platforms, workspaces, and enterprise social strategy. Also joining us is Marcy Maddox. She is the Senior Director of Product Marketing uh, um, in the Customer Experience Management sector at OpenTech. She has 15 years of experience in web technology. She's responsible for managing and launching OpenTech CEM products to the market. She has a bachelor's degree in computer science and MBA in e-business. Now I'll pass it over to Rob. Audrey, thank you very much, and, and Marcy, thank you for joining as well, and thank you to all of the folks who took the time out of their uh, day today to join us. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and get started here in just a second. Um, Audrey, can you bring the deck up that we should be using? Um, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> so again, thanks everybody. I always actually really enjoy uh, the opportunity to, to work with open text, and, and I think it's been you know, very interesting from a historical standpoint. Um, I've been in this for a long time. I've been in the in the document collaboration space, and I've been in the um, uh, in the document management space as well as now this enterprise social space for for about 25 years. And and during that time, I, this has been kind of a I would say a fair to say a non sexy technology. Um, around, uh, you know, in general that, um, you know, you didn't think to yourself, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to invest in, in document collaboration or I'm going to invest in document management technologies in order to really enable the entirety of my business to be, to be more effective, in order to enable the entirety of my business uh, to be more competitive. And then over the course of the last eight years that I've been with Forrester, we've seen that completely flipped on its head. Everything has... Um, has just changed so dramatically. Uh, and I think, um, I think the best description I got of this was, um, was probably through our CEO, George Colony. And um, uh, George Colony actually, um, there we go. George Colony actually called this, uh, this, this last 10 years, the, the economic challenges that we face, a gateway recession. And, and it started to resonate. He said, you know, we're going to do business differently as a result of, of this kind of economic downturn that we've been that we've been going through. And then during the course of the last eight years, as a as an analyst, I've seen us go from you know from from real tentative um, associations with technology, you know, to 
a huge demand around these knowledge worker centric technologies. And, and a lot of it was user driven, user demanded. We want these new technologies around content. We want these new technologies around social. Why? Because they drive business value, because they drive huge amounts of business opportunity. And we've seen the organizations respond to this as well. What we've seen, you know, huge investments around social. Enterprise social has, has evolved over the course of the last 10 years. We've seen the mobile phenomenon evolve. We've seen fundamentally new ways of working with content and freeing it up and really having this magnified value that goes across all of the users in an enterprise. And IT has really responded in a very, very compelling way in that they're turning these opportunities, these, these things that we're, we're, we're often characterizing as problems into this business strategy and this business opportunity. And at the same time, they're addressing security and they're addressing adoption, they're, accept, they're addressing all of the things that are really important from an organizational perspective, but they're doing it in a way that actually exceeds the expectations of users. So let's give an example. What's, what's really beginning to go on here uh, as we see this, this kind of fundamental shift and this movement towards investing in knowledge worker technologies to provide long-term differentiation in the marketplace? So first off, we have this, this whole concept of, of Everything that's old is new again. So I mentioned I like working with open text because they've been in this for a very, very long time. They've been, it's, I, I, I can't say that there's never been a time when I don't remember open text being in the content management field because I actually do remember before that. But certainly I don't remember any, but any time when we, where we used the term content management when open text wasn't involved. And open text has been involved in a lot of different areas around this, whether it's been portals or, or formal document management or the rise uh, of mobile, all these pieces have been kind of core. And, and one of those core pieces has been um, around the concept of portals. So, you know, you probably didn't tune into this today to think that you were going to get, a, a, you know, a, any information about portals. It's kind of an old technology. It's gotten just white hot at Forrester, this, this whole concept of, of portals and, and intranets and, and how do we work with knowledge worker information. And it all maps back to all the same disruptive things that we're talking about, you know, as, as, as we're getting going here. So we have up in the upper left here this concept of traditional page publishing. We had folks who provisioned technology in order to be able to better address the needs of employees by giving them the information that they needed rather than having them have to go look for it. So rather than picking up the phone, rather than um, calling somebody rather than ser searching around, the information was packaged up in a way that was, was very straightforward, very simple. Now, 15 years later, and, and most, most of that, 15 years ago, most people actually put together a pretty compelling portal strategy. Now, 15 years later, our phones are ringing off the hook, and all of these disruptive technologies are coming into the scope of these projects. So. These inquiries come into Forrester, those of you who are Forrester customers, Forrester clients, you understand we, we spend a lot of time working with clients during the course of these half an hour phone calls that we call inquiries, and they all come in in the same way. So I've, got to, I've got to refresh the portal. What am I doing when I refresh the portal? I still have to be able to, to do that traditional page publishing. I still have to be able to access line of business data. But I also have these multimedia requirements. I no longer am just thinking about things in terms of the written word or the visuals. I have multimedia, I have, I have spoken word, I have podcasts that are becoming part of this, and increasingly I have video that's becoming a part of this world. And even more so, I have user-generated uh, um, um, video, video and content. We have this redefined role of business content, business content which was something that was largely separate. If I think about how organizations managed their business content Used to be, look, I've got, I've got my, my high-end document management systems that I'm using in, in the most important parts of my business. I'm handling legal documents. I'm handling uh, a claims processing in a, in a financial services environment. I'm handling invoicing. But the rest of that stuff, the rest of the content that we normally worked with uh, was being sent around as, as file attachments. It was being put onto file shares. It was being put into places where it was fundamentally not usable. And we tried to address this 10, 15 years ago through knowledge management initiatives, and guess what? They didn't work very well. So now this concept of business content being something that we can bring in line into this worker's environment has become something that's become very, very important 
Uh, and then lastly, we'll dig into this next piece a little bit more here in just a moment here uh, around enterprise social capabilities. So I am allowing users to have a voice in how my organization is run. I'm allowing to users to interactively work with each other in much more interesting and compelling ways. It started with, you know, with, with the consumer-based side of things. It started with Facebook. It started with Twitter, and, and we saw some huge results happening out there, and it began to permeate the enterprise about, about six or seven years ago in really compelling ways. But all of these things that I'm talking about here, which were separate initiatives, separate pieces of technology that were coming into the enterprise over the course of the last several years, all to address these, these opportunities for the more efficient knowledge worker, are all coalescing into a single uh, environment. We, we call it the engagement workplace at Forrester. We've had the concept of the information workplace. We, we recently recoined this the engagement workplace because there is now such an emphasis on users being able to provide content into the environment as opposed to it being more institutional. Marcy, is this, does this resonate with what, you, with what you've been seeing in the market and, and what you're seeing from the perspective of open text? Yes, I wanted to jump on your comment there about users having a voice in the technology and tools that they want to see. In fact, uh, one retailer happened to mention that in order to understand that cultural shift that's happening is giving the empowerment to their employees and out to their other channels, like their partners and suppliers and distributors. So this workplace that you've described here around mobility and social and collaboration is really an evolution we see for the adoption of these consumer technologies into real business value. So I'm hoping you can talk about that more as well. Yeah, and I think I think this is the this is the concept we've seen, and I want to and I want to pop onto social as as a first piece because social is particularly interesting. So what you know what you said when you know, as you mentioned that Marcy, let's give everybody in the organization a voice. That can be a little scary, right? Because everybody everybody might not speak in the same voice, and somebody might say some things that uh, that we regret later. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a diligence associated with enterprise social, but enterprise social I think is, is maybe a little bit the red-haired stepchild of all the pieces that we're going to cover here today. So let's jump into that first because um, it, it's been it's very interesting. So uh, when I joined Forrester about eight years ago, I was put on enterprise social first, and we saw this kind of arc, and the arc kind of went from, hey, this is going to change everything to, eh, we're kind of getting pretty tepid adoption. We're not quite sure this is as exciting a piece of technology. This was probably two years ago, as we saw. And at that point, it was, it was one of my colleagues, TJ Kitt, unearthed some data. And, and, and this data stated very clearly that enterprise social, d demand for enterprise social, was being driven by baby boomers. Well, that was really interesting to us. Why, why, did, why was it baby boomers that were demanding demanding access to enterprise social technologies, well, it turns out that baby boomers have a really, really high need for access to current content, for access to expertise. Why? Because they're in jobs that actually require that and where if they have that access, they can do their jobs better. I spent a lot of 2012 really trying to drive down into the business value of enterprise social, and we came up with some really interesting patterns. And, and the piece that was sort of foremost was demand for enterprise social to the extent that this provides transformative business value within the organization is directly tied to business value. In other words, I use this stuff when it helps me get my job done more effectively. So we built out this fictitious company. We did a huge amount of surveying. We did a huge amount of interviewing on the topic. And, and we built out this viability versus business value map. So, so the thing on the left is, how likely am I to adopt it? How likely am I to change the way I work? And, and how much incentive do I have to, to, to do so? And then on the right, what's the business value uh, if I get there? And, and, and through the interview, we built this composite organization. And what we came up with was there are patterns in the organization where, where you can define the pointy end of the stick, where, where you're going to have your initial value. Although, do we do think that this will be transformative across the entirety of the organization? Sales popped up to the top. Why did sales pop up to the top? Well, salespeople tend to be highly mobile. They tend to live and die based upon the quality of the information and the quality of the content and the quality of the expertise that they can get to during the course of their jobs. And 
they're very willing to change the way they work. So when we saw this correlation to baby boomers, we saw two things, mobile sales professionals and mobile executives. They wanted it. They were demanding it in a very, very big way. And they also had the ability to change how they work. So you see like in the bat and blower left hand corner, you see poor little manufacturing down here. Manufacturing tends to be very staid in how they do business, very process driven. Uh, oftentimes there are, there are huge risks associated with changing how you do things. But we have great, great examples of organizations that have moved in the direction of social and have reconfigured how manufacturing takes place. So it works across the organization. But we started with sales, and we took a look at what salespeople were, do what were doing that was fundamentally different from the rest of the organization, and, and we begin to see some patterns. So, Marcy, is this anything surprising here in terms of, like, wh wh where you're seeing the, custom the, the uptake? I mean, I, we all do tend to look at sales first for sales opportunities, but. No, I, I wouldn't say that it's surprising. I think it's actually spot on that social has evolved into more of this collaborative culture where the sales team um, and other parts of the organization, not just the marketing side, are looking to share information and accessibility in real time at the moment that they need it. And having those right tools becoming the backbone of their business is critical for moving forward into the next era. Um, and I do agree with you, you know, social began this era. Um, and now it's becoming a foundation, a framework for other business applications to be built on top of, such as in um, HR, manufacturing operations, and et cetera. And, and I think that as we work through that uh, communication vehicle for manufacturers or other industries, they're going to find more and more opportunities to sharing those files in a secure way. It's a great point, Marcy. And I want to build on that in just a second because we're going to talk about the technology underpinnings, how these things become, how the applications themselves become social. But we'll dig into this sales piece in just a quick second. I want to talk about our friends in customer service just before I switch the slides because it's really interesting. You know, we're going to go through all these things that say if I have better access to information, if I have better access to content and experts, I can do my job more effectively because I can serve the customer more effectively. And the interesting piece as we went through the research was, well, isn't all that true of customer service too? And the answer was absolutely yes, but I wanna, I wanna focus a little bit on this, this idea of viability. How, how, much, how, much, how much ability do I have to change how I do my job? Well, if I'm a salesperson and I'm out driving around in a Porsche or a Tesla, all I'm measured on is how effectively, how effectively I make sales. I have a lot of freedom in terms of how I do my job. If I'm in customer service, I might have different types of organizational requirements. You gotta do 25 calls an hour, and that makes it harder to start to embrace these new technologies. So there's a change management component that says, if you really are moving into this age of the customer, if you really want to be able to have world-class uh, capabilities at serving your customers across all pieces of your organization, you have to begin to think differently about how you serve all these different parts of the internal parts of your organization. So let's look at the sales process, right? So CRM, Salesforce Automation, is nothing new, right? We've, we've been investing in these technologies uh, for, for quite a long time. And as we've invested in these technologies, they have tended to be pretty structured in our approach to them. So we, we define opportunities, we have a pipeline of how much, uh, how much is in the, in the product pipeline or in the sales pipeline, how much, am I, how much am I gonna sell next quarter, how much gonna sell two quarters out. We have financial obligations to be able to do this very well. And, and we have seen this sort of, emo, this sort of um, evolution of CRM and Salesforce automation as a very structured tool for predicting how well you will be able to sell. But then we have these swim lanes. So, so we really kind of did this research based upon a structured process and then said, what was happening underneath? What were the swim lanes that were happening underneath? And, and could we begin to take a much closer look at how organizations are either losing money or losing opportunity or are having excessive costs associated with the process based on the inability to locate the right information at the right time. So number one, right off the bat, I, I've identified an opportunity. I've put something into the CRM system that says, I'm going to sell $5 million worth of ribbon cravices to a company in Western Europe. Is this good business or is this bad business? We saw salespeople that began to set up social networks 
where they were asking other folks, have you done this before? Should I go down the street and look for another opportunity? Is this the type of business that we tend to win? We, type to lose, we tend to lose. The cost or opportunity was around whether or not they were pursuing bad business or pursuing business that was going in the wrong direction. And it was an issue around collective action. And it was an issue where in lacking any kind of social capability in the enterprise, there was really no mechanism for being able to go out and talk to a large number of people, particularly people that you may not have met or may not have interacted with before, who could collectively decide this is a good way to go or this is a bad way to go. If you think about the old, um, you can be a millionaire, you, 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 you too can be a millionaire, the, the TV show where you could either ask a friend or you could do a 50-50 or you could poll the audience, the audience was always the most active, was always the most accurate. Collectively, we come up with better ability to judge an opportunity or to judge a particular situation than we can individually. Who are, who's out there that has skills, defining the skills? Again, in sales, if somebody has actually pursued a particular type of work before, I wanna know it. And the CRM system is very, very bad at letting me know who out there has a particular expertise. However, social networks are very good at defining who has expertise who reads certain types of information, who comments on certain types of information, who gets highly rated in terms of their opinion on certain types of information. When I can identify those people within the auspices of a sales opportunity, I can actually drive a sales opportunity forward much more effectively by bringing the right, uh, the right um, uh, people and the right experts to bear. And they're really hard to find. If I go out um, and, and I actually interview organizations, a lot of times as we're going through these these next generation infrastructure projects where we're provisioning new types of technology and we, and we go out and we survey and interview people and say, how do you find an expert on a particular topic if you don't know the expert exists? They say, well, I either walk down the hall, they're, they're very geographic in their nature, or I talk to somebody that's close to me in my organization. So where we see social deployed in sales, it's that somebody across the entirety of my organization who I haven't met who's either globally distributed from me or organizationally distributed from me is probably the one who has the best answer. And this could be someone who's on the services side of the business. This could be someone who's on the customer service side of the business. This could be someone who's in operations or human resources, for heaven's sakes. Uh, the next big piece is, do the, exist, do the assets already exist? And we, we talked about sort of the knowledge management paradigm. Social is really, really good at capturing assets in the context of either an opportunity of a community, of an area of expertise, and being able to make those reusable. When we email things around, basically what happens is they are only available to the people that are either on the two or the CC list. It becomes a proxy for an access control list, and only the people that you know ever, are ever able, ever able to label, le leverage that, that information. We've seen this complete redefinition around knowledge management, and business content management around social and some of the other content um, artifacts that we're talking about here today. Uh, and then lastly, just the act of being able to get a team together to work effectively, particularly across geographic boundaries, across time zones, it's really difficult to do. So in the worst case scenario, you used to see people all fly together to put together the sales opportunity in the win room. The win room now becomes something that's virtual. So. So salespeople eat this up. They go off and, they, and, they, and, they're, and they're provisioning these social networks on their own in order to, in order to accomplish these types of things. And, and there's just a great opportunity for IT to come in and talk about how this can be done uh, in a more planful way, in a more programmatic way. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about one of the things that, that IT really brings to the table to, to light up this dynamic. Yes, let me just jump in on a few things there, Rob. And, and I want to point to our, our Twitter stream um, that Dr. Randy Bach happened to summarize it fairly well, which he says, one of the quickest adopters of technology are those who need to be the most nimble. And I think that's a really good summary in that, as you described, when we try to bring together that virtualization, that virtual model of what is naturally inherently a human uh, socialization of information gathering. I love the example of the, the millionaire story because you do tend to look for validation and information touch points across the world, across the board. And putting together in this, these swim lanes 
what we've seen happen is the disruption in technology letting us forget what some of the core fundamentals are for us just finding, discovering, sharing information in a streamlined way, kind of taking that human factor and bringing it more into the benefits of the technology. So I think that was a very interesting approach there. It was a very interesting point approach. So I got a chance to peek over at the Twitter stream while, while you were talking, Marcy, and, and, and uh, building on Randall Bach's comment. You know, that was sort of the core of what we found when we said, holy cow, it's the, baby, it's the baby boomers that are adopting it. Why is it the baby boomers? Well, it's the baby boomers who are in the jobs, whether they're in mobile sales or whether they're executives, that have to be most nimble, right? They have the, last, the least structured jobs. So even though all of our assumptions about the, you know, Generation Y, the millennials being the ones who are most comfortable with the technology, most willing to adopt the technology, that all was true, right? The digital natives are really, really comfortable in this technology. It was the need to be nimble in terms of access to expertise and content that drove the need for, uh, for the baby boomers to adopt the technology. And then, of course, you know, the other piece I think that, that's really worth noting from a generational perspective is the Gen Yers aren't that young anymore, right? The millennials are, are now eight, nine years into the workforce, and they're moving into those senior, more senior positions and bringing with them those skills of the digital native. There's a technology component to this that I think is really interesting, and I think, again, sort of the breadth of the, of the open text offering makes this kind of an interesting conversation to bring up with you in particular, Marcy, about, you know, with open text as a company and open text customers, which is that these things are not technically different, right? So, Marcy, you made a comment about all of the things that we do becoming social, and, 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 I, and I think that um, I think that's the case. I think that's absolutely the case. We talked about the social fabric. We've talked at Forrester about social enablement. We've also talked about content enablement. And, and what it really comes down to is, you know, if we go back to, to those things that are happening in the swim lanes below, and let's look at this from a different perspective. How do you design an application? If I design an application, and, and again, this is the most, the most basic kind of Salesforce automation function at the bottom, staying with the, staying with the, with the metaphor that we've had to date. How do I handle something as basic as an approval for a price change request, right? There is a mechanism in the, in the system to ask for an approval for a ch price change request, and there's an area in the system to note that we've done a price change request, and then accounting gets notified of that, hopefully. But there's a whole bunch of things that happen above that. Why am I asking for a price change request? Why am I asking to sell this product at a different type of discount? Who can help me figure out whether AI can do that? Should I do it? Does it make for good business? What documentation do I have to provide as to why I'm doing it and why someone else might want to do it in the future? Who has the authority to approve it? And those things tend to be completely disconnected from the underlying structured system. So, you know, in, 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 in the most basic terms, I, I can think about it, I'm looking at a screen and, and there's all this great uh, information there coming from the structured process. And when I'm ready to do a price change request, I send an email which is state-of-the-art 1990, um, you know, and it's completely disconnected. All of the decision processes that are happening here, all the ability to find experts, all the ability to document why you've made the decision are all lost. All the knowledge associated with all those things that happen in this particular swim lane are lost. So there's a technology component to this that comes in as well. So we're modeling this from the perspective here of, of how a salesperson would go about looking at a Salesforce automation process, but it happens across the entirety of processes. And I think it's interesting to get open text opinion just because you obviously have assets around structured content management, around structured document management, around workflow technologies and business process automation technologies, as well as social technologies. Uh, so, so Marcy, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on this particular diagram and, and you know, given, given sort of a, the perspective that open text brings. Yeah, let me point out a few a few things. One, I think you're spot on <clears throat> with talking about just from a historical and decision making process that all is not lost, that it is captured and can carry forward outside of just a single email that has that contract. Which, you know, we are seeing the application of this file sharing happening in specific processes. You mentioned a price approval process here. It might be a um, signature of a contract, very sensitive information that you need to bring in a lot of different types of people 
to be able to comment. And the structured and unstructured processes that you show in the graphic here um, need to be recorded and passed on for that legacy and finding that information later. And we're seeing, interestingly, that a number of uh, board of director type of use cases coming up where they want to use communities to collaborate around their meeting notes, share those files out, um, and make sure that it's, in, it's available in the mobile component because they all have their iPads, they're taking their notes, but they want to have that conversation both electronically and with each other that they can then track from a, a mobile tablet back to the notes that they are sharing for historical purposes. So um, I think there's a lot of growth that we can do here in applying those technologies, as you were mentioning, to this interaction documentation process at the top of the, the graphic here. And it, and it brings us to a different part of the conversation. We're going to start to really start to hammer on that during the course of the, the next few minutes, which is that why do I want IT involved? Well, okay, we talked about security. We talked about compliance. These things are important. We're going to talk about them more. But if you look at this chart, if you look at how you design this, this is, this is an IT-driven thing, right? This is not a, you know, go off and, and find an application that runs on your iPad or your iPhone that you really like in order to handle something. We're talking about actually integrating technologies that exist within the organization in, in a fairly structured way. And some of this might be, uh, have really strong implications in terms of our technology um, uh, acquisition process, right? What are the technologies that we can bring into this social loop? What are the technologies that we bring into this content loop that are designed to be integrated with these underlying technologies and can allow us with the most, uh, the most seamless experience? I brought up the customer service people earlier. We picked on the customer service people saying, you know, they might have not have the incentive in their job description and their performance review process to, involve, to get involved in doing things that are more social, more content focused, because we're actually measuring them in a different way. Uh, and we might have to think about change management there. We also might have to think about change management in terms of how we design the applications that they look at. So within the context of a job where you are trying to work rapidly, you might need to have a highly integrated solution that allows you to look at the next best step. The next best step is actually going out to a community or going out to a going out to experts to get the next piece of the of the uh, puzzle in order to best serve a customer. And switching between multiple applications is first off, it's always a good way to lose a user, right? Anytime you give them a great new piece of technology and say. All you have to do is go to a completely different application with a completely different interface and log in again. You're going to lose users to begin with, but you also lose the context of moving from application to application. So the idea of IT being involved in order to create a seamless experience across this unstructured and structured world is really, is really important. But Marcy, you, you teed me up on the mobile thing. So I want to do two things. I want to talk really more specifically now about mobile, but also switch gears a little bit and talk more about documents and content uh, as part of that engagement workplace, and then a little less about uh, around the social aspects, although they are, they, are, they are one and the same at the end of the day. So if we look at the upper right, we have some information from our, um, from our workforce survey, and, and, and this is always an interesting um, uh, data point for us. We, we actually, we, we talk a lot to, to IT professionals, what are you intending to, to provision, what are you intending to buy, what do you look for in terms of benefits from it, but then we go back out to some rather large data sets around what are you using? We ask the workers directly, what are you using? What applications are you touching? What types of devices are you using? And, and this is really, uh, you know, I don't think this is any surprise. It, it, we ask folks, how many devices do you use for work? It used to be one, right? It used to be a, yeah, an IBM PC or an Apple Macintosh. Now we have 29% that say two, 22% that say three, 17% that say four, we actually have 4% that say six or more. So the number of devices that we're working with in order to get our job done is increasing. It's increasing dramatically, and it's increasing because there is tremendous business value in being able to use multiple devices. I happen to be staring at you at a laptop uh, right now, and it's got a camera on it, and it's, it's very, very well-tuned at what I'm doing right now. Later today, I will get up, and I will leave, and I will pick a tablet up. And the reason I'll pick the tablet up is because I'll be mobile in terms of how I work. I'll be on my way to work with a client. And when I want to show that client content, whether the content is text-based or video-based, 
I can hand them a tablet and it's a much more usable form factor. It's also an instant on device. It's also a device that in this case I can access without going through a VPN in order to get to the content that I need. So again, it's sort of that nimbleness of being able to access the content that I need in real time. So the smiley guy on our left here is our, he's, he's our disruptor of the moment, right? He, he's, he is the guy who's bringing in new technologies and some of these are consumer technologies and, and specifically we're gonna talk a little bit now about think and share, right? Those things that allow me to synchronize my relevant content across multiple devices so that when I'm out doing my job, I have access to it. Why is he doing this? Why, why is he doing it? Because he's ill-behaved, because he got an iPad uh, for the holidays and he wants to make use of it? Or is he doing it because, again, we come back to that business value? So when we dug down into use cases, we saw interesting use cases, and again, we'll continue on with the theme of, of the mobile sales professional. The mobile sales professional, let's look at you know, an instance where we, where we were talking to pharmaceutical reps. They're walking down the hallway. They have three or four minutes that they have with the doctor before the doctor walks into a, well, talk to a patient. And when that doctor turns the corner and goes into that patient room, they might not get to talk again for three weeks. So they have a huge opportunity for being able to move a process forward, in this case, sales process, based on immediacy, based on nimbleness. What do they do? They want to show, the doctor says, show me the information about this. Tell me how, tell me about drug interactions. Show me the ad you have that's coming up. Uh, that's going to be playing during during the next big sporting event. Well, with an instant on device, with sync and share, that salesperson can actually go and get that information and literally give it to the person in real time in an incredibly uh, attractive form factor for them to consume. And, and that three or four minutes of walking down the hall becomes the difference between being able to move their job forward and, and not move their job forward. You know, we, we came up with the examples around sales. The pharma sales rep was particularly interesting because of the, the cross-section of the nature of how their salespeople do business, but also the nature of the content that they were sharing, which was content that was, was, was pretty important to the well-being of the company, content that they were used to controlling in a, in, a, in a very secure and diligent and compliant manner, and suddenly it was leaking out onto these devices. So. You know, huge opportunity, right? We keep calling it the problem, the consumer sink and share problem. I really kind of want to turn that around to the consumer sink and share opportunity because there's just a huge opportunity to serve the needs of this individual that's trying to share across multiple devices and, by the way, also share external to the organization across the firewall. Yeah, I'm going to jump on your, your sharing externally as well because I think you're right in that you have to choose the device that is most tuned to the process that you're working with right now. And I would say that's even true of the sensitivity of the data that you're sharing. Email, as you said, are, is only shareable to the two in the CC line. But when you're looking at other audiences that you want to gather in their information, uh, you will need to look at more of these file sync and share type tools. And we're finding that many of our clients are also wanting to augment those traditional workflow processes with more of this social collaborative nature to extend the reach, you know, back to you, if you pick up your tablet and you want to take that greatest new presentation or new research that you have out to your client in the most uh, efficient way, then how do you get it transferred to them? Can you open it up and show that to them as well? And if you're trying to find the right sensitivity of data tools, you can't just look at an email or passing it on a USB device, but rather the other things that are available for security as well. Yeah, and you make another great point in there, Marcy. So number one, security is obviously a big piece, but the other piece is in your statement you said, I'm pushing that stuff out because I know you're going to need it, right? So I'm no longer asking the user to drag things into a folder based on what they think they're going to need. I know a lot of times what they're going to need, so, so that's a big piece of it as well. I want to talk to the audience for just a second. So we've got a poll here, um, and um, let's go ahead and um, ask uh, Audrey to put the poll up. Okay, opening All up right. the poll. Everyone go ahead and submit your answer, and we'll leave it open for a few seconds here. So the question here is, you know, do you have, is Think and Share being used in your organization? And, 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 you know, and this is sort of the, you know, there are the consumer tools out there being used or if you thought about it. So, you know, the different ways you can answer this is, no, we haven't checked. You know, we, 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 we don't know uh, if it's being used or not. Um, hey, yeah, it's getting used, but we kind of look the other way. Um, 
we know it's in use and we think it's a problem, we've blocked it, or you know what, we have an enterprise strategy, we've actually thought about this and, 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 and we've thought about it to the extent that we've actually come up with a strategy in order to enable our users to take advantage of this capability. Let's go ahead and give a, and give a spec to this. And, and what I might also ask here is that as our audience is thinking to check their box, is, is it maybe only a particular use case? You know, it may not be uh, completely enterprise-wide in your last selection there, but are you even thinking of it in potentially one area of the business like customer service or sales? That, yeah, I, lo I love that. So, that, so, that, so by the way, Marcy, we are coming to the conclusion that you might have more than one of these in your organization, and it might be part of that answer D, yes, we have an enterprise strategy, and the strategy is that certain people based on certain use cases get something that is either designed for greater levels of integration or designed to, to handle greater levels of security. Great. So can we share the results? Okay. We have about oh, a little few stragglers here. Go ahead and close it. Just a few seconds here and we'll share the results. Now we wait on bated breath for the results to see how our audience is adopting. <laughs> um. So we got a fair amount of no answers, but yeah, so pretty much, you know, what we, you know, pretty much what we probably would have expected here, um, that we, we have, you know, a fair number of people that, that are not sure, you know, I, you know, I, I would sort of leave you with this, it's probably worth checking. Um, you know, if, if you haven't checked, you, you might find that people are, are using these tools a lot. Um, it almost always tends to be the case. A, a lot that are saying, hey, you know what, they're getting good business results, let's go ahead and, and, and allow them to use it. Um, uh, a few that have blocked the access, uh, and then a nice number on the 22% around the folks who have an enterprise uh, strategy. So we're, we, are, we are beginning to see this mature. Um, and, and there's a number of reasons to kind of look at why you want to do this. Number one is if you don't know that people are using it, you may have those security issues, you may have those compliance issues, but you may not have the, the full value that you're, that you're looking for in terms of this either. So a lot of the a lot of the um, solutions that we see are really quite tuned towards one simple thing, which is sharing that file. And there might be a lot more that you're doing with that file. So in the center, we see the content, right? And we do want to share that across multiple devices, and we do want to share it externally to users. But we also do this stuff called document collaboration, right? We actually put these pieces of content through different processes. Marcy said that there's a point at which I know you're going to need that content and I'm going to put it on the device for you. And it might be because you need that content in the, in the context of a sales opportunity, in the context of a performance review within human rights resources, in the, comment, in the context of a particular thing that you do uh, in, in supporting customers in a services-oriented environment. Uh, and we've invested in these document collaboration technologies. Uh, in, in fact, if we look at the uptake of, of document collaboration and the uptake of file sync and share, um, and we put this against email. So think about email as you were trying to get people out of the email, it tends to be what they use for everything, and we're giving them better and better tools to handle specific pieces of their job. If we look at the left, we see how people are using um, team document uh, sharing sites on a computer. And so there's about 35% of folks that are, you know, either um, that are using these things on a, on a fairly regular basis, so the green and the blue bands there for team document sharing. And then similar numbers, fairly close numbers on the, uh, on the file sync and share uh, piece. If we go over and we look at the same thing from a tablet, right, a tablet device, an inherently mobile device, we see the numbers jump up to, you know, 52% are using file sync and share. Uh, and, and then, you know, still a, a fair amount that are using these, these document collaboration sites. So, and why we bring this up, we bring this up, number one, to show that there is obviously, you know, more evidence around the value of using these things in a mobile environment, but also that these have been separate workloads. They've been separate decision points in terms of when and how you've purchased these things. Uh, and, and they are so inherently designed to work together. Um, I want to put one more point on this kind of mobile piece, and this is around mobile engagement. So. 
Um, my uh, colleague T.J. Kitt, who I mentioned earlier, had come up with the, the great data around, uh, around finding the baby boomers. Um, he found another very interesting piece of, of, of information. He does a lot of work about uh, around the concept of engaged workers, workers that have a strong belief in the company, workers that are your best employees. And he found an incredibly high correlation if you look at the uh, green bands going down versus the lighter green bands, people who work more mobily, people who work from home, people who work from client sites, people who work from different telecommuting sites tend to have a stronger belief in the company. So it's one that is a little bit of a softer data point, but I think as we're looking at an economy that's growing and it's getting harder and harder to hire people and we're seeing more and more people retire, we're moving back into that realm of I want to be a really attractive place to work. And a really attractive place to work, by the way, the other piece that TJ came up with is really people who really like working for their company actually work for companies that do a really good job of serving the needs of their customers. So, uh, so this support of, of mobile um, as, as a work style is, is incredibly important, not only to the business opportunity, but to the well-being of your employees as well. And just to bring on another point to that mobile worker there in terms of sharing information, I think we also have to look at the response time and the accessibility to those files as well, um, especially if you're dealing with large files. You mentioned earlier in one of the statistics is we want to move away from email because of perhaps the sensitivity or the accessibility of those files. So here in your next graphic, I think you're going to talk a little bit about just the pure volume that we have of getting information, leveraging those devices, and in some cases the file access could be huge from going from, you know, 300 documents that would take three days now coming down to just hours or minutes. So and it's an important point to look at as well. Very large documents as well as very complex documents. And then also the last piece we want to put out in sort of the landscape of the document that's living in the middle and then we've got the farmer rep who's distributing it, sharing it, we're talking about it, participating in document collaboration. You know, let's not forget that we still live in a world of compliance. We still live in a world where privacy is important. We still live in a world where security is important. And that investment in those back-end document systems of record, those things that are able to archive, those things that are able to apply records management to an environment, those things that are able to manage those pieces of content in a diligent manner, is part of the overall continuum. And, and, and as we're looking, as we talk about cloud and mobile and, and consumer-based technologies, let us not forget that there is a legal imperative to address the one on the bottom here, that document system of record for many organizations. This is, this is very important, and it's something that we will always bring up as part of the strategy. So we've kind of brought you through different pieces of this here, and, 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 and not all these things are necessarily requirements for any particular tactical solution in your organization, but at Forestry we will always ask you to look at these different pieces. Do you have to think about security? Do you have to think about things living in a system of record? Do you have to think about document collaboration? Do you think about security and compliance as the device goes out, as the content goes out onto that mobile device and as it's shared externally? Uh, and, and, and address these opportunities that are coming in through these kind of disruptive consumer forces with an eye towards an overall strategy for, for all of these different pieces. So we want to do one more quick poll before we close out. And, we want to, and we've talked about file collaboration, we've talked about sync and share, and we've talked about social. And, 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 and again, I, I started with a trend that says these things are becoming increasingly integrated workloads, but I want to get a sense from the audience. Are these things that, now don't think about your current investments, but in a perfect world, are they serve, best served by separate applications? Do we think about this concept of social being content dependent, be, and content development being highly a social activity, so these things should all be a holistic strategy? Or you know what? In general, maybe an integrated solution is better, but there's instances where I have to think about a targeted solution. Go ahead, Audrey, and give them a quick minute here on this. Right, and I'll pull up a, a statistic that I think Forrester had published around 97% of information workers are communicating, collaborating on a day-to-day -day business, um, from how you're sharing information to working in specific tasks or workflows. And I think as we look at our answers coming up here, 
the way we're going to fuel this change in the way we work is going to be built around our ability to have the file collaboration thinking and other social related capabilities inherent to our culture and the way we want to work. Uh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, all right. Now we're leading the audience, Marcy. Let's let them answer. That. <laughs> of course, we have to. We have to share some of this goodness with them. We we knew we 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 knew we knew where we stood on it when we came in. Um, Audrey, how we do it? We've got about forty one percent of the audience who's answered. Should we go ahead and close it up? Sure, let's go ahead and close it up. We're, we've got one more slide that Marcy and I want to talk to you with just a quick, um, just a, just a, you know a, a, some quick thoughts on some wrap ups. But you know at this point, you know if you have questions, we you know we go ahead and can you go ahead and start getting them into the um, uh, into the Q and A box because we're gonna we're gonna leave a, a little a fair amount of time here to, to answer questions. So we know that there's been a lot that we've presented here uh, as well, uh, and you can put those questions into Twitter as well using the hashtags that we uh, identified earlier. All right, poll results are up. So, um, mm, so the winner is, uh, in general, we like an integrated solution better, but there are instances where a targeted point solution is required, and I think that's actually kind of what we're seeing in the market. Um, you know, it's still a fair amount that say, you know what, they are they are separate workloads depending upon how my organization is, is set up. Um, but, but that tends to be, Marcy, the answer that, that, that we get most often is, we need to think about integrated. We kind of get what you're talking about here, but you know what? As I sit here and listen to what you're saying, I can think of very specific instances in my company where I have to handle things uh, in, in a very specific way. But you know, yeah, I, 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 mat I we call this a mature answer set here, um, in that we, we, you know, a few months ago or a year ago, we would have gotten a lot of the A's that you know, hey, I'm thinking about a blue sky world. Everything should be integrated, and and it's been tending as we ask this question to move towards C. Now, I think our audience is, is spot on as well in terms of tying together the, the different workflows because it's not going to necessarily be a point solution all the time or a point uh, use case, but rather if I do have something that's going on in my community world, can I share that information back inside to advance another discussion that may be happening in a different group? So it, it is good to see that we're looking at an integrated solution. Yep. Let's go ahead and get this uh, get this kind of closed out. This is where we started. We have these things that work well together. Uh, we think strategically and in terms of integration, they work well together. Uh, it tends to be, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, the you know the the, the 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 overall driver of of you know too many tools and too little context being shared is problematic. Um, a more integrated solution is better. And with that, this kind of document future of document and social collaboration, we do think mobile is becoming this dominant consumption and creation platform. And increasingly, this is how we interact with content. And then certain types of content like video, better on mobile devices, actually. Um, this generic collaboration becomes more purpose-driven, right? The, the idea that I'm collaborating for a purpose, and that purpose might be sales, and it might be, uh, it might be around service, customer service, and it might be more better if it's more deeply integrated into the underlying application. Um, think and share, huge opportunity today, but you know, really something that we see becoming increasingly a feature uh, of a broader set of capabilities. Uh, and the same with social, right? That, that social is something that is in line with my applications, in line with how I do my work. Um, we've talked about adop adoption for a long time, how to drive adoption. You know, really it just gets down to Business value is where adoption is driven. The more business value you can drive, the more people are willing to use the product, to use these new types of technologies. Um, product barriers between these things break down. We really do think that these things will become increasingly integrated either through suites of applications or through partnerships between organizations to allow their products to work together more, uh, more effectively. And as part of that, content becomes this portable asset that's used wherever and whenever you need it. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and, and, and hit some questions here. We've got, we've got a few minutes here to, to address the audience questions. So uh, anything particularly, um, particularly interesting that we see going on here? Yeah, and I'll just summarize a bit there as well. I think you brought up a few good points throughout the presentation around 
the CIO looking strategically across the information management story and structure of the applications uh, because they're probably getting hit by a number of different projects from legal to HR to customer service, as you mentioned, and having that ability to share it both internally and externally. Uh, the point of our conversation today was how do we work together and collaborate without compromise? And I think that that's a good way that we could summarize here while we're looking at some of the questions is look at your business a little differently in terms of information management and using tools like file thinking and uh, social and collaboration as that foundational backbone. So, um, so Marcy, is a great question here from, from uh, Tara Reese. And, uh, and it's, the question is, is this second poll results price of technology driven? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to interpret that as, you know, it, you know, did we sort of overlook the price components in all of this? And, and, I, and I think the answer to that is, um, is yes, that, um, that there are two factors that happen. We, we've really put a, a very big focus here today, a very sharp point on the topic of business value. Um, and, and the piece that we didn't hit quite as hard is, as these technologies become integrated, I think some of the technologies tend to become uh, commoditized as, as part of the overall as part of the overall option. So, um, you know, does any one of these pieces of technology uh, a work better? But b, can you get it less expensively if it's a bundled feature as opposed to uh, as opposed to a separate uh, technology investment? And, and yeah, without without a doubt that you know we do see we do see that there is a there is a uh, a factor here around around aligning this with you know with your with your uh, strategic vendors or strategic partners around your enterprise solutions uh, and the opportunity to drive costs down through bundling. And just to add to that, it's also um, being sensitive to all the integration points you might have into other data silos of information that you want to share as well, um, and having those integrations be solid uh, and that is affecting that cost and price as well. Yeah. Um, there's a great question slash comment from Pedro Correa here, um, and uh, and I think it talks. We, Pedro, we talked, we touched on this a little bit. So Pedro's question is: We still need to couple social collab content initiatives to business strategic drivers and objectives, even when this type of knowledge hasn't reached the leadership strategic level, right? And the answer is yes, right, absolutely. So I talked about that change management component. And, and that change management component, you know, we've sort of lightly stepped through. You know, there's a reason that we focused on salespeople and why salespeople are so important as sort of these canaries in the coal mine about why there's an opportunity here. And it's, it's because they have the opportunity to change how they work. But, man, there's a lot of messiness involved in here. I want to be able to have the ability to collectively run things within my company. Well, what if collectively run things within my company means everybody in the organization collectively decides that we can do manufacturing in a fundamentally different way and better way? That is a really, really confrontational thing for an executive to be faced with uh, and a conversation that I may well want to shut down if I'm an executive. So, so number one, executive leadership, executive participation in these types of initiatives is really important because, because if this is not happening, these things will either fail or they'll get shut down and it'll happen fairly quickly. Um, and, and then the other piece is this sort of overall role of, uh, of, of change management in terms of how I run my company and what opportunities I have, you know, another really, really big piece that, 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 is, uh, that is really important. If you, if you don't have executive support, you've got to really think about driving it. And, and, I, and I think one of the things that has been valuable is business value is a really, really interesting way to drive executive support. Especially if they're using the tools themselves, like I gave the example of the board of directors earlier. When it becomes their day-to-day -day task and activity to have those tools as, as well, it'll trickle down into the rest of the culture. Yeah, and, and I, think, I do think it's worth noting, again, you know, when we get back to like who's driving it, it tends to be fairly high-ranking people in the organization that have the greatest need for these technologies. So, um, so if you don't have the executive support, there there is a sales job to be done to make sure that they're on board. But again, they tend to be among the biggest beneficiaries of these types of technologies. 
Sorry to jump in here, um, Rob and Marcy, but there's another question submitted from Erin, um, more of a comment actually. So she says, it's really difficult to find an integrated solution that has all of the necessary functionality, but is accessible enough for people to adopt it. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, and, 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 and I agree. Um, so where you have to look at is, you know, how many pieces of the technology do you need to have integrated? And then I think the other piece is we have to throw out um, a fair amount of kudos to the vendors that are in this space. So, so first off, uh, you know, there will be more and more uh, things that are, that are put together as features within a suite of capabilities and more and more vendors that will want to sell you more and more of their stuff. Where the kudos come in is I think that the assumption that you're going to get everything from my company is beginning to break down and that we're starting to see more and more integration across multiple technology stacks and, and more importantly, more and more attention to open standards so that there isn't the assumption that you have to get everything from my company. You can actually get it from my company and the folks that we partner with, and, 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 and I do think that there's some kudos on the vendor side that, that we have solutions that are just fundamentally more open um, than, we've seen, um, than we've seen in the past. And, and again, I don't think that when we're saying that there's a suite of capabilities that you're looking for, that you necessarily say that that suite of capabilities has to come from the same place. They simply have to be part of the same strategy to figure out what you need uh, and, and, and where you'll source that from. Marcy, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think he's, he's right on about the integration and having the right tool sets uh, built in together and, and having it in a way that is easy to use. I think Pedro had a comment here on, on our um, line about, you know, do you look for the workforce to do validation um, versus the leader? So I think there is a piece of that to it, but perhaps you need to look at the broader perspective of what, where all the projects are coming in and someone at that leadership level would have an oversight to it. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. We have a few more questions, but we're past um, our hour. Would you like to take a few more questions before we close out? Let's awesome. take one more. Yeah, let's take one more. One more? Okay. Um, we've got one here from, um, let's see, this is from Heeman Shu. Um, it's more of a comment as well that he would like you to speak to. Um, Professor Piskorski at Harvard Business School says there are four types of social strategies enterprises should follow to meet business object objectives. They are reduce costs by helping people meet, yep. reduce costs by helping people strengthen relationships, mm -hmm. increase, increase willingness to pay by helping people meet, and increase willingness to pay by helping people strengthen relationships. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that? Um, yeah, so underneath those swim lanes, there were all of those pieces where I am reaching out to people in my organization in order to drive things more effectively, in order to find things. But we talked a lot about in order to find expertise and in order to act together more effectively as a community. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's been, you know, so, so, so those themes have been, have been really strong in terms of drivers of how to get to the value. And, and what really is this, it comes down to, I think, is this, trusted relationship among people that you haven't necessarily met, these stronger bonds um, that you have among people to be able to help you out in a trusted environment. And, and in large, we see, it in, we see it in a couple of instances where, where it's really important. Number one is large global organizations where there might be somebody that, you know, we talked about that person out there that has the information that I need uh, in order to get the job done. If I don't have a trusted relationship, if I don't have the opportunity to get to know that person a little bit more effectively and have some sort of relationship that I brokered through this, through this new technology, um, then I don't trust them, right? And, and, and so this, this trust component, I think, um, that's discussed becomes, becomes really important and it becomes really impactful, again, around sort of the business value. We, we worked with a consumer packaged good company that was putting out new products and they had multiple divisions that were working on similar products and the ability to work across those organizational boundaries in a trusted way that actually saw those benefits 
um, was was really really impactful. So yeah, I think I think I think all of those things fall into that sort of ability to act collectively and be able to establish areas of expertise within the organization. So yeah, very very powerful. And I'll just summarize that I can agree with that because that is where the Open Text Tempo product grew out of an evolution of our users wanting to move from traditional document management into a more of a collaborative experience that was built on relationships and the collective of that information. So um, definitely want to see us build on that topic more. Okay. Well, with that said, we'll close it out. If we didn't get your question, apologies. We'll have someone follow up with you shortly. Um, just to note, this recording will be available um, later on this week on CMS Wire, and we'll send registrants um, a follow-up email with a link to that recording later this week. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, Rob, for joining us. Um, and stay tuned for more webinars from CMS Wire. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you.